in the course of Christian history, particularly in the last couple of hundred years, several individuals have been proposed as the Antichrist of Scripture. I've just made a list of some of them. It was believed at one time that the Kaiser might be the Antichrist. Others believed that it might be Benito Mussolini. Others thought that perhaps it was Adolf Hitler, or the Ayatollah Khomeini, or Yasser Arafat, or perhaps Henry Kissinger, or Saddam Hussein. And a more recent candidate, believe it or not, somebody suggested that it might be our president, Barack Obama. Obviously, all of these individuals are simply guesses. There's no rhyme or reason to proposing these names. But we don't need to guess, because the Bible tells us very clearly when the Antichrist system was going to arise, where the Antichrist system was going to arise, and what the Antichrist was going to be like. So if we go to the Bible, we're going to be able to answer those questions fully and completely. Now in this presentation, we are going to study in a disciplined, careful, and contextual manner. There will be no guesswork. I'm going to use what is known as the historical flow method. You'll be able to determine what this method is like as we study along, but basically this method that the Bible itself contains is that the great chain prophecies of the Bible have a starting point that is defined in the Bible and an ending point that is also defined in the Bible. And the Bible then describes all of the events that transpire one event after the other between the beginning point and the ending point. So if we know where a prophetic sequence begins, and we know where it ends, and we have everything in between, then we can follow the flow of Bible prophecy throughout history and we can know exactly where we are at each given point in the development of the history of the world. And so we are going to use a disciplined, careful, and contextual approach to studying about the Antichrist in Scripture. Now I want to make it clear that we're going to speak about a system, a worldwide system. We're not going to talk about individuals within that system. There are many true, loving children of God that are found in that system. They don't know any better. They don't have the information that I'm going to share with you in this presentation. And so no one should take this as a personal attack upon them, because we're talking about a global religious system. We're not talking about these individuals who are within that system that perhaps have no knowledge and no understanding really about all of these things that we're going to talk about. Now I also want to emphasize that in prophecy you're dealing with symbols. In other words, you don't take the language literally. You take the language as being symbolic. In other words, you don't take the language at face value. Each item in the prophecy symbolizes or represents something much larger beyond the literal. And so we are going to take a prophecy of the Bible, which is one of the better known prophecies of the Bible, Daniel chapter 7, and we're going to follow the sequence of this magnificent chapter that, by the way, was written about 600 years before Christ ballpark. So I'm going to go to Daniel chapter 7, and I'm going to begin reading at verse 1, and we're going to meet some symbols right from the start. It says there in Daniel chapter 7, and verses 1 and 2, In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream, and visions of his head while on his bed. In other words, he had a dream. Then he wrote down the dream, telling the main facts. So Daniel has this dream, and now he is going to tell us what this dream was. In verse 2 we find these words, Daniel spoke, saying, 
I saw in my vision by night, that's a way of speaking of a dream in scripture, he was sleeping, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea. Now we have two symbols in verse 2. First of all, we have winds, and secondly, the great sea. Now what is represented by the great sea? It's not talking about any particular ocean. The sea is symbolic of something beyond itself. I want to go to Isaiah chapter 17 and verse 12 where the meaning of waters is explained. The meaning of the sea is explained. You need to understand, I emphasize once again, that the Bible is referring to symbols. You know, the Bible for example speaks about the beast. And uh, you know, it's not talking about a literal beast. The beast represents a system. The time periods we're going to find in prophecy are also symbolic. And so the question is, what does the sea symbolize or represent? Isaiah 17 and verse 12 gives us the answer. Notice the comparison that is used. Woe to the multitude of many people. To the multitude of what? Of many people who make a, a noise like the roar of the seas. So what are the seas compared to? They're compared to what? They're compared to many people. And then the second half of the verse says, and to the rushing of nations that make a rushing like the rushing of mighty waters. So the rushing of the waters represents, according to this, the rushing of nations. And of course the winds represent strife, they represent war. In other words, these nations are rising in the midst of war among the peoples, among the waters, so to speak. And so Daniel is going to see a vision of the nations of antiquity that are rising in the midst of war, in the midst of strife. Now I want you to notice that the vision continues by describing four beasts. Notice Daniel chapter 7 and verse 3. Daniel chapter 7 and verse 3 says, And four great beasts came up from the sea, each different from the other. So I want you to visualize this. Daniel sees this strife among the nations, wars and rumors of wars, and now he sees four beasts rise from the sea, one right after the other. Now, what do the four beasts represent? The Bible tells us. The very chapter that we're studying tells us what the four beasts represent. We're told in Daniel chapter 7 and verse 17, those great beasts, which are four, are four kings which arise out of the earth. So the four beasts represent four kings, and of course kings rule over what? they rule over kingdoms. So it's just not an individual king, they are kings that rule over kingdoms. Now the Bible uh, very commonly uses beasts as symbols of nations, and we do that the same thing in these days. For example, what is the beast that represents the United States? An eagle. What is the beast that represents Russia? A bear. What is the beast that represents England? A lion. What is a beast that represents China? A dragon or a serpent. So even today we use beasts as being symbolic of what? Symbolic of nations. So these four beasts represent four kingdoms or four nations that arise one right after the other. Now let's take a look at these four beasts. The first beast we're going to find a description of in Daniel chapter 7 and verse 4. And we don't have time to study all of the details, I just want you to have clear in your mind the sequence of powers that we have here, the order of the powers. It says there in Daniel chapter 7 verse 4, the first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. It can't be England because this is way back in the Old Testament. So there was another nation that had a lion as a symbol. So it says the first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. In the Bible wings represent speed of conquest because the eagle is a very swift bird 
and it's a bird of prey, incidentally. It continues saying in verse 4, I watched till its wings were plucked off, and it was lifted up from the earth and made to stand on two feet like a man, and a man's heart was given to it. In other words, its wings were plucked, which means that it was going to lose its what? It was going to lose its dominion, or it was going to lose its power. Now the question is, what kingdom is represented by the lion? We don't have to guess. Because this historical sequence begins in the days when Daniel lived. So the question is, what kingdom was ruling the world when Daniel lived, where this prophecy begins? It was the kingdom of Babylon. Incidentally, do you know that uh, the ancient city of Babylon has been excavated, and they found that at many of the entrances into the city of Babylon of antiquity, Nebuchadnezzar had made sphinxes with heads of lions. So the lion is very closely identified with Babylon. In fact, in Jeremiah 51, Nebuchadnezzar is referred to as a lion, and he was the king of Babylon. And so we know where the starting point is for this prophecy. The prophecy begins in the days when Daniel lives. It begins with the kingdom of Babylon. Are you clear on this point? Now, there's a second beast. Notice Daniel chapter 7 and verse 5. It says, And suddenly another beast, a second, like a bear. By the way, it's not Russia because Russia didn't exist way back in those days. It's just another nation had that symbol also. And suddenly another beast, a second like a bear. It was raised up on one side, in other words, the bear was higher on one side than on the other, and had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. And they said thus to it, Arise, devour much flesh. Now why was this bear raised up higher on one side than on the other? Well, you'll have to go to Daniel chapter 8 to understand. You see, this uh, nation represented by the bear was a dual kingdom. It was a kingdom compare, uh, composed of two nations, the Medes and the Persians. And if you look at history, you'll find that even though the Medes ruled at first, the Persians became predominant and the Medes disappeared from history. And so you find that this, this bear is higher on one side because one of these kingdoms was more predominant than the other. Are you following me? Now, it's interesting to read about these three ribs in the mouth of the bear. What do the three ribs represent? We know from history that when the Medes and Persians came and attacked Babylon and conquered Babylon, they had to conquer the last three provinces of the kingdom of Babylon. Those provinces were Lydia, Egypt, and of course the city of Babylon. And so the three ribs in the mouth of the bear that devours the lion represent these three provinces of the kingdom of Babylon that fell when the Medes and Persians conquered them. So we have, first of all, Babylon, and then we have Medes and Persians. And incidentally, you don't even have to go to the history books, history books to know that the lion is Babylon and the bear are the Medes and Persians. You say, how do you know that? Because the book of Daniel tells us very clearly which was the kingdom that conquered Babylon. If you go to Daniel chapter 5, there was a handwriting on the wall that said, Mene, Mene, Tekel, Uparsin, which means your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. In other words, the kingdom of Babylon would fall and it would be given to the Medes and to the Persians. So Daniel 5 itself, the book itself tells us what was the next kingdom after the kingdom of Babylon. It was the Medes and Persians who conquered Babylon. But we have a third beast. Daniel chapter 7 and verse 6. Daniel chapter 7 and verse 6. It says there, After this I looked, and there was another, like a leopard, let me ask you, is a leopard a pretty quick animal? Is it faster than the lion? Oh yes, but this is not a leopard who's only fast. I want you to notice that the wings are intensified to tell us that this, that this beast is a leopard very fast, but it has four wings, which means that it conquers very quickly. So it says, after this I looked and there was another, like a leopard, 
which had on its back four wings of a bird. The beast also had four heads, and dominion was given to it. This third kingdom is Greece. In fact, if you go to the very next chapter, Daniel chapter 8, you're going to discover that the kingdom that conquered the Medes and Persians was Greece. The name is given in Daniel chapter 8. So you don't even have to go to the history books to know who the first three kingdoms represent. They represent Babylon, the kingdom in the days of Daniel, then the Medes and the Persians that conquered and destroyed Babylon, then you have Greece which conquered the Medes and the Persians. And you'll notice that this leopard beast had four wings of a bird. In other words, it was going to conquer very quickly. Do you know who the first king of the kingdom of Greece was? It was Alexander the Great. Do you know how long it took Alexander the Great, the Great to conquer the entire world? It took him just nine years. And he died in a drunken stupor when he was just 31 years old. He didn't have anything more to do. He had conquered the known world in that time in only a period of nine years. Now you notice that this leopard beast has four heads. You know, you look at history and you find that when Alexander died, his kingdom was divided into four kingdoms. In other words, it was a united kingdom, but when he died, it was divided in four. If you look at history, the names of those kingdoms are the Antigonids, the Ptolemies, the Seleucids, and the Attalids. You can look this up in any history book. And so the leopard is fulfilled in Greece specifically and exactly. But then you have a fourth beast. I like to call it a dragon beast, even though it's not called a dragon. In Daniel chapter 7 the description shows that this is a terrible dragon like, like a Godzilla, if you please. Notice Daniel chapter 7 and verse 7. After this, I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast. And what kind of beast was it? Dreadful and terrible, exceedingly strong. Notice this is a dreadful beast, exceedingly strong. It had huge iron teeth. It was devouring, breaking in pieces, and trampling the residue with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. So you have a fourth beast, a dreadful and terrible beast with great iron teeth that tramples, and it just totally destroys everything it finds in its way. Let me ask you, which was the kingdom that conquered the kingdom of Greece? All you have to do is go to history. In fact, you don't even have to go to history. You say, why not? Because we all know that the kingdom that was ruling when Jesus was here was Rome. The New Testament tells us that Rome was the power that was ruling. And so if you use the New Testament, you know that the fourth kingdom that conquered Greece is the kingdom of what? The Rome. It is the Roman Empire. But now I want you to notice that something happens with this beast. You notice this dragon beast uh, has ten horns, and by the way when it rises to power it does not have the ten horns yet. We're going to come to that a little bit later. I want you to notice that there are really three stages to this fourth beast. First of all you have the fourth beast by itself, then it says that the fourth beast has ten horns on its head, and then something happens. Notice Daniel chapter 7 and verse 8. Daniel says, I was considering the horns, and there was another horn, a little one, coming up among them. Notice, the little horn comes up among what? Among the ten, right? And so it says, a little one coming up among them, before whom three of the first horns were plucked out by the roots. In other words, three of the ten horns were plucked up by the roots. They disappeared from history because they were uprooted, in other words. And then it says in the last part of the verse, and there in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking pompous words. So are you visualizing this? You have the flow of history. It's very simple. Can you follow the sequence? Easy. Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, the Roman Empire, ten horns, and then a little horn. 
But what I want you to notice is that the book of Daniel makes it very, very clear that this four beast has three stages of rulership, three stages of dominion. Notice Daniel chapter 7 verses 23 and 24. Daniel 7, 23 and 24 has the three stages of this fourth beast, and I'm just going to tell you what they are. First of all, you have the fourth beast ruling by itself with no horns. Then after it rules for a while, out of the head of this fourth beast come ten horns. And then after the ten horns are in place, you have a little horn that rises among the ten, and it uproots three. Is the sequence clear? Now let's read it in Daniel chapter 7, verses 23 and 24. Thus he said, The fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom on the earth. See, the fourth beast is what? A fourth what? So it's not only a king, they're not only four kings, they are actually what? Kingdoms. So the fourth beast is a fourth kingdom on the earth, which shall be different from all other kingdoms, and shall devour the whole earth, trample it, and break it in pieces. And now notice, the ten horns are ten kings who, what, shall arise from this kingdom. Does the kingdom have to exist in order for the ten to arise from it? Of course. In other words, this dragon beast existed for a while by itself with no horns. But then after a while, this dragon beast sprouts ten horns. And then I want you to notice the next in the sequence, the third stage. It says in verse 24 once again, The ten horns are ten kings who shall arise from this kingdom, and another shall arise what? After them. Do you see the sequence? The dragon beast ruling by itself, then it sprouts ten horns, and then among the ten horns rises the little horn, and it uproots three of the ten horns. And so it says, And another shall arise after them. He shall be different from the first ones, and shall subdue three kings, or three kingdoms. Are you following the sequence? So how many stages of dominion does the fourth beast have according to Daniel 7? Three. The dragon beast by itself, the dragon beast with the ten horns, and the dragon beast with the little horn, and three of the horns uprooted. Now we need to focus on the little horn. Because the focus of this prophecy is on the little horn, and practically all Christian scholars agree that the little horn represents the Antichrist system. Some people think that, that the little horn represents an individual, others believe that the little horn represents a system. In other words, it represents not only a single individual, but it represents uh, a nation, if you please. Now let's read about this little horn. Daniel chapter 7 verse 25 tells us what this little horn is characterized by. It says there, He shall speak pompous words against the Most High. In the book of Revelation we're going to notice that the pompous words are blasphemies. Just keep that in the corner of your mind, that the pompous words that the little horn speaks are blasphemies. Daniel says pompous words. So it says, the little horn shall speak pompous words against the Most High, and then you have a second characteristic, he shall what? He shall persecute the saints of the Most High, and here comes a very important one, and shall intend, the King James Version says, he shall think, to change what? Times and what? Law. Whose law? God's law. Because you notice it says, He'll speak words against the Most High, He'll persecute the saints of the Most High, and He will think to change times and law. It must be God's law, because that's the focus of the war of the little horn. And then it tells us how long this little horn was going to rule. We're told there in Daniel chapter 7 and verse, verse 25, Then the saints shall be given into His hand for a time and times and half a time. So you say, what is that time, times, and half a time that the little horn is going to rule from the time that it rises to power? Keep that in the corner of your mind, we're going to deal with that. We're going to take seven characteristics now that identify the little horn. And then we'll go to Revelation and add some additional identifying characteristics. The seven characteristics are the following, and I'm only going to give them, and we're not going to identify the power yet, we're simply going to mention the characteristics. First of all, the little horn rises after the ten horns 
are on the head. Is that correct? So it has to rise after the ten kingdoms are there on the head of this dragon beast. In other words, the ten horns represent the divisions of the Roman Empire. Did you know that the Roman Empire was divided into ten kingdoms when it fell in the year 476? The Bible tells us that, uh, that Rome was not a united kingdom forever. It actually was divided into ten kingdoms, and the nations of Europe today are the result of the divisions of the Roman Empire. You look at the nations in Europe, they all speak a different language, they all have a different culture, they have a, a different geographical uh, uh, territory, they have different cultural customs. In other words, each nation in Europe was the result of these invasions by the barbarians from the northern sector of the empire that carved up the empire into ten divisions. And by the way, uh, the Roman Empire was divided finally in the year 476 when the last emperor was deposed from his throne. His name was Romulus Augustulus. There were no emperors after the year 476 in the Western Roman Empire. So the first characteristic is that this little horn has to arise after the year 476 because it rises after the ten horns are in place. Are you clear on that point? Second, more specifically, this little horn has to be a Roman horn. It has to be a Roman power. You say, why, why would it be a Roman power? Well, it's very simple. The fourth beast represents what? Rome. So if the little horn comes from the head of the fourth beast, it must be what kind of a power? it must be a Roman power. So not only does the Bible say that it would arise uh, you know, among the ten after the ten were complete, but it specifies uh, what kingdom it was going to be related with. We're told that it comes from the head of the fourth beast which is Rome, and that means that the little horn must in some way be related to Rome. Number three, this little horn uproots three of the ten kingdoms. So the ten kingdoms are there, the little horn rises among the ten, it's a Roman horn because it rises from the head of a fourth beast which is Rome, and when it rises to power it uproots three of those horns of the divisions of Western Europe. And then we're told that it speaks blasphemies against the Most High, so we're going to have to identify what blasphemies are. Then we're told that it persecutes the saints of the Most High. In other words, it is a persecuting power against God's faithful people. Then we're told that this is a power that thought it could change even God's holy law in some way. And finally, it is a power that rules for time, times, and half a time. Now let me explain something about time, times, and half a time. In the book of Daniel the word time or times refers to years. You say, how do we know that? Because in Daniel chapter 4 the Bible says that Nebuchadnezzar for seven years went somewhat insane. And we're told that seven times passed over Nebuchadnezzar. That basically means that he was insane for how long? He was insane for seven years, but it's expressed as seven times. So time, times, and the dividing of time means time is one year, times, which is the dual in Hebrew, when it doesn't have a qualifying number it means two, time is one year, times is two years, and half a time is half a year. So you're dealing with three and a half years, and every Bible scholar agrees that time, times, and the dividing of time is equivalent to three and a half years. But just remember something, in the Bible, in prophecy, we're dealing with symbols. We're not dealing with literal time. We're dealing with symbolic language. The lion is a symbol, the bear is a symbol, the leopard is a symbol, the, the, the sea is a symbol, the wings are symbols. So the time period must also be what? It must also be symbolic. Now the Bible year, and I don't have time to go into all the verses, I can just mention for example uh, Genesis chapter 7, 11 uh, compared with Genesis 8 verses 3 and 4 uh, clearly shows that the biblical month has 30 days. Now if the biblical month has 30 days, let me ask you then, how many days would the year have? All you do is multiply 30 times what? 30 times 12. 30 days times 12 months gives you how many? 360 days 
in one year. But you're dealing with how many years? You're dealing with three and a half years. And so you have to multiply three and a half times what? Times 360 days each one of those years. And so the result is how much? 1,260 days. But in prophecy, days are equal to what? Days are equal to years. So in other words, this power from the moment that it arose, it was going to rule for a period of 1,260 years. It, would gonna, it was going to be the longest ruling power in this prophecy of Daniel chapter 7. Now you say, who does this power represent? Let me just qualify what I'm going to say for a moment. There's only one power in the world that fits every single one of these specifications that we find in the prophecy, these seven points that I've mentioned, and that is the Roman Catholic Papacy. Now I ask you to please bear with me. Don't shut off the DVD player at this point. No matter how painful it might be to you, don't shut off the DVD. You need to listen to the entire presentation, and then you can make a decision whether this is true or not. I want you to understand that I'm talking about a system. I'm not talking about individuals. I mentioned this before. There are many sincere loving Christians in the Roman Catholic Church. In fact, I believe that probably most of God's true people are in the Roman Catholic Communion. They don't know any of these things. They don't know anything better. They love the Lord with all of their heart, and they serve the Lord to the best of their knowledge. So we're not casting a reflection upon individuals who belong to this system. We're talking about the system itself, because the Bible is not talking about individuals. It is talking about a system. Are you understanding what I'm saying? Now let's take a look at these seven characteristics to see how they are fulfilled in the Roman Catholic Papacy. First of all, let me ask, did the papacy rise to power after the Roman Empire had been divided into ten kingdoms? Just read the history books. Absolutely. The Roman Empire, as I mentioned in the year 476, had been divided into, four, into ten kingdoms. And then in the year 538, shortly thereafter, the emperor said that the pope would be lord in the eastern and the, and the western sector of the Roman Empire. And so prophecy is very clear that the papacy arose after the ten kingdoms were in place. Let me ask you this, the second characteristic. You remember that the little horn rises from the head of the fourth beast, which is Rome. So must the little horn have something to do with Rome? Yes. So what is the papacy called? It is called the what Catholic Church? It's called the Roman Catholic Church. Where is its capital city? In Rome. Let me ask you, what is its official language? Latin, the language of Rome. And if you look carefully at the organizational system of the Roman Catholic Church, the names are different, bishop, archbishop, cardinals, and so on, but it reflects practically identically the organization that existed in political Rome. The Roman Catholic Papacy simply inherited it and they changed the names. You know, you can read uh, books by Malachi Martin and, and uh, he'll tell you, he was a, a Jesuit, he died several years ago, but he himself says very clearly that, uh, you know, the Roman Catholic Papacy actually uh, is a Roman power that arose after the Ten Kingdoms were in place. Now the third characteristic is that the little horn would uproot three of the ten horns. Now in Europe today there are nations that descend from seven of these ten, little, of these ten horns. But there were three nations that were heretical. In other words, they believed that Jesus was a created being. They followed a theologian by the name of Arius. And therefore the papacy used its influence upon the civil power to uproot these three rebellious kingdoms. The Heruli were one of those kingdoms. They were uprooted in the year 493 AD. The next kingdom to be uprooted was the Vandals. They were uprooted in the year 534. And finally the Ostrogoths were uprooted in the year 538. 
these three kingdoms were torn up by the roots. There is no nation in Europe today that descends from these three kingdoms. They disappeared from history. Whereas in Europe you have, for example, the Franks, uh, France, you know, the Franks settled there. You have the Lombards, that's Italy. You have the Anglo Saxons, that would be England. You have all of these nations in Europe that descended from these ten kingdoms. But there are three kingdoms that were uprooted by the papacy using the civil power because these kingdoms did not agree with the teachings of the church. And so the papacy fits perfectly with the description of the uprooting of the three horns. Now you notice also we said that the little horn speaks blasphemies against the Most High. Say now wait a minute pastor, you're telling me that the papacy has spoken blasphemies against God? Well, let's take a look at what the Bible tells us blasphemy is. See, most people think that blasphemy means an infidel atheist that raises his hand to heaven and defies the true God. That is not the biblical definition of what blasphemy is. We need to allow the Bible to define blasphemy, not Webster's Dictionary. And so what is blasphemy? The Bible gives a definition. Do you remember that Jesus one time uh, was accused of blasphemy because He healed an individual who was paralyzed and He forgave his sins? Notice what Jesus was accused of by the religious leaders when He said to this man, your sins are forgiven. Mark chapter 2 and verse 7 has the record. His enemies, the enemies of Jesus said, why does this man speak blasphemies like this? Who can forgive sins but God alone? So what is blasphemy? Blasphemy is when a mere human power claims to have the right to what? To forgive sins. Now Jesus had a right to forgive sins because He was the Son of God. But if any human, human power claimed to be able to forgive sins, that would be the biblical definition of blasphemy. But the Bible also gives another definition of blasphemy which is related to this one. Notice John chapter 10 and verses 30 to 33. John chapter 10 verses 30 to 33. When an individual claims to be God on earth or the representative of God on earth or one who takes the place of God on earth, the Bible defines that as blasphemy. John chapter 10 and verse 30, Jesus made a revolutionary statement. He said, I and my Father are one. And notice the reaction of the Jews. It says, Then the Jews took up stones again to stone Him. Jesus answered them, Many good works I have shown you from my Father. For which of these works do you stone me? The Jews answered Him, saying, For a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy, because you, being a man, make yourself God. Jesus claimed to be the representative of God on earth. He represented the Father. And so anyone who claims to represent Christ on earth, to take the place of Christ on earth, would be committing what? Would be committing blasphemy. And you know what? The Roman Catholic Church claims that it has the right to forgive sins. And it also calls the Pope by a certain name, Vicarious Philidae, which means Vicar of the Son of God. The word Vicar means one who takes the place of the Son of God. And so these characteristics of blasphemy fit the Roman Catholic papacy perfectly. And then you'll notice the next characteristic, and that is that the little horn would be a persecuting power. You might be aware that uh, both Pope John Paul II and Pope Francis I have apologized for the many individuals who were slain by the Roman Catholic system. In fact, John Paul II wrote a long apology to all of those who had been slain by the Roman Catholic Church because they believed differently than the church and they practiced differently than what the church taught. In fact, in a very interesting event that happened just recently, Francis I visited Torre Pellice in the northern sector of Italy, the Piedmont. You know, the Waldensians, or the Waldenses as they're called, were just terribly persecuted by the Roman Catholic Church. The, the Catholic Church tried to eradicate them from history. And Francis I went and met 
in the church there in Torre Pellice, and he apologized to the Waldensians for the way in which the Roman Catholic Church had persecuted. Certainly the Roman Catholic Church has persecuted many people that, don't, uh, that didn't agree with the Roman Catholic Church. You know, years ago I had the privilege of visiting the city of Lima, Peru, and I'd always wanted to go and visit one particular place in Lima, and that was the, what is known as the Palace of the Inquisition. You know, there were inquisitions in three specific countries uh, of the Roman Catholic Church, uh, mostly uh, the countries that the Roman Catholic Church mostly dominated. Uh, those three places were Colombia, and by the way, in the city of Cartagena, uh, you can go there and they still have some of the uh, paraphernalia that were used in the Inquisition. The other country was Peru, and they also had an Inquisition in Mexico. So I went to visit the Palace of the Inquisition in the city of Lima, and I want to share with you some very interesting things that happened while I was there. At the very entrance of the Palace to the Inquisition, and you can go there, you know, you can look it up online if you want, Google it, it'll give you everything that I'm telling you right now. Uh, when you go into the palace there's this large mural that portrays an auto de fe in the Plaza de Armas. Auto de fe is when an individual is being, uh, being uh, judged to determine whether the person was going to be burned at the stake because they believe differently than the church. After this the tour guide took us into what is known as the torture chamber. I was amazed at how our young tour guide, she was a young girl, she might not have been more than 22 or 23 years old, described the methods of torture that were used against those who did not agree with the Roman Catholic Church, and how heretics were actually burned at the stake. As she guided us through this chamber of torture, she showed us several different implements that were used to persecute those who did not agree with the church. First of all, you have what is called the strapado, and let me just describe it to you. The victim's wrists were bound behind their back with a rope, and then the loose end of the rope was tossed over a beam that was above the body. The victim would then be raised slowly with the rope uh, you know, with his hands behind him, he would be raised slowly with his hands behind his back. And then when the victim was high off the ground, the rope was released abruptly, but before the individual reached the ground, the rope was stopped. And so you know what would happen. The shoulders and the arms would be totally dislocated. The tour guide said that sometimes uh, 25 pounds were hung to the legs of the individual, and of course when they were raised with their hands behind their back with this rope that was over a beam, and then they would raise them and they would release the rope, of course with the weights on their legs it was even worse. Their arms were practically torn off of their body because they did not agree with the teachings of the church. Next, as I followed along in the different, uh, the different uh, torture mechanisms that were used, was the whipping post. The tour guide said, you know, individuals who were uh, heretics and did not, uh, you know, believe in what the church believed and, what, and did not practice what the church practiced, they, their hands and their feet were placed in stocks, and then they were given a minimum of 50 and a maximum of 200 lashes on their back with a whip simply because they did not agree with the teachings of the church. And then you take a left turn, <laughs> you know, I'm, I can visualize it right now when I went through this tour, uh, you take a left turn and on the left hand side is what is known as the rack. Basically the victim was laid upon a table, face up, with arms and legs fully extended. The victim's ankles and wrists were then tied with ropes that were attached to pulleys at the ends of the table. There were wheels at either end of the board that were turned and pulled the arms up and pulled the legs straight out. The wheel was slowly turned, and this pulled the rope tighter and tighter around the hands and the feet until the victim was dismembered. What do you think? 
I continued the tour. The next implement of torture was the garrote. It was an instrument that slowly strangled the victim. The hands and feet were tied with the rope to the arms and legs of a chair. A noose was placed around the neck of the heretic. In back of the chair was a wheel that worked as a tourniquet. The wheel was slowly turned, and this pulled the rope tighter and tighter around the hands, feet, and neck until the victim was strangled, because they did not agree with the teachings of the church. Waterboarding was next. They actually have, you know, they have illustrations of this there in the torture chamber. An individual was placed on a bench with face looking up, and then their nostrils were pinched, and water was poured through a funnel into the victim's throat. Sometimes a cloth was forced down the throat as well, and pouring water down, the, per the person felt like they were being uh, drowned, actually. Also I noticed that there were underground tunnels where dungeons had been hewn into the rock. These dungeons went deep uh, under the ground, and they had little cubicles, hardly big enough to fit a human being, and individuals were placed in them for days on end, in a cold, dark, black place, without the family knowing where they were. All of this, by admission of the tour guide, was do done by the Roman Catholic system against those who did not agree with the church in their belief and in their practice. You know, there were some people who were lucky, and that is they were taken to the plaza and then they were burned alive. Probably better to be burned alive than to be tortured with all of these implements. Are you following me? So let me ask you, did the Roman Catholic system persecute the saints or those who did not agree with it? I wish I could tell you something different. It's no reflection, if you're a Catholic, there's, it's no reflection on you personally. I know that you would never do anything like this, but the system did it. Have you ever heard about the holy office of the Inquisition? You know, you, I could tell you things about the Inquisition in Spain. Hundreds of thousands of individuals who did not agree with the Roman Catholic system were tortured and were slain as a result of their beliefs. Now the, la the sixth characteristic is that this system claims to have changed God's holy law. We notice that as one of the characteristics. Let me read you a statement from a Roman Catholic encyclopedia. This is a very well-known encyclopedia. It's by Lucius Ferraris. The name is Prompta Bibliotheca. I have a copy of that, um, I have an original actually, of uh, that entire set of commentaries. Volume 8 in the article Papa, in the article Pope. This is what it says there. The Pope can modify divine law. Would you agree with that? The Pope can modify divine law? That's what it says. The Pope can modify divine law, since his power is not of man but of God, and he acts in the place of God upon the earth with the fullest power of binding and loosing his sheep. This is only one statement, I could read you many more. You know at Secrets on Seal we have a syllabus and I have page after page after page of claims that have been made by the papacy regarding this. You know, time and again they say, we were the ones that changed God's law. Now the question is, how does the papacy claim to have changed God's law? Let me share it with you. If you go to the Roman Catholic Bible, you're going to find that the Roman Catholic Bible has the Ten Commandments exactly the way that Protestant Bibles read. You're going to find, for example, that the second commandment in the Roman Catholic Bible says, don't make images and don't bow down to them. But when you go to the Roman Catholic catechisms, which are used to teach the kids and to teach individuals who are adults who want to join the church, that commandment is gone from the catechisms. It's taken out, in other words, of the Ten Commandments. So if you take one of the Ten Commandments out, you're left with how many commandments? You're left with the Nine Commandments, but the Bible says there's ten. Everybody knows that there's Ten Commandments. And so because the Second Commandment is taken out, something has to be done to have ten. 
And so basi basically what the Roman Catholic catechisms do is that they divide the tenth commandment into two parts. You shall not covet your neighbor's things, and you shall not covet your neighbor's wife. Believe me, covetousness is covetousness. It's one commandment whether it is things or whether it is your neighbor's wife. But because the second commandment is taken out of uh, the Ten Commandments in the catechisms, they only have nine, and so they have to divide the tenth in two ten to end with Ten Commandments. Now let me ask you, why do you suppose the Roman Catholic Church would not want people to know about the Second Commandment? You know, I say it respectfully and lovingly. You know, I, I, those of you who are going to be watching this, you know, I love you from the bottom of my heart. You say, how can you love me when you're saying all these bad things about my church? Well, it's not me that is saying all these bad things. It is God's Word and its history that corroborates God's Word. Would you rather not have anybody tell you? You know, would we want to be like the uh, proverbial ostrich who hides his head in the sand and says, Ooh, the enemy's not there because he can't see him. No, we need to know in this stage of history what these powers are. And so folks, what the Roman Catholic system does is it takes out the second commandment because the Roman Catholic churches are filled with idols and people bow before these idols. And they say, well, we're not actually worshiping the idol, we're worshiping God through the idol. It doesn't make any difference. The Bible says don't make any graven image and don't bow before them. It doesn't say, you know, it's okay if, uh, if the, you believe that the idol simply represents God. Any idol is going to diminish our concept of the true God. It's going to ruin our concept of the true God. Another way in which the Roman Catholic Church has professed to claim, uh, change God's law, and this is the worst of all, it claims to have changed God's day of worship from Sabbath to Sunday. In the first presentation on this DVD, we followed the trajectory of God's rest day from Genesis all the way to the New Earth. And we noticed that uniformly, all throughout Scripture, very clearly, there is only one day of worship, and that is the Holy Sabbath. It was established at creation, before sin, before there was any Jew. It was observed by Jesus when He rested in the tomb on the Sabbath day. And it will be observed when God makes a new heavens and a new earth where God's people will go to worship before the Lord from month to month and from Sabbath to Sabbath. Nowhere in the Bible are we told that the day of worship was changed. Jesus kept the Sabbath. Paul kept the Sabbath. Peter kept the Sabbath. The women that uh, came to see Jesus' tomb rested the Sabbath day according to the commandment. And we, we noticed in our first study together that Jesus Himself rested in the tomb on the Holy Sabbath after finishing His work of redemption on the sixth day. The Bible is so clear. There's no room for misunderstanding. But the Roman Catholic Church says, you know, God has given the church authority to change the Sabbath to Sunday. Once again, I'd like to mention that at Secrets Unsealed, I have a syllabus that has page after page after page after page of statements from Roman Catholic scholars, popes, archbishops, cardinals that say the Roman Catholic Church, by the authority that God gave it, has changed the day of worship from Sabbath to Sunday. We already talked about the period of time. We're talking about this little horn ruling for 1,260 years. You look at the history of the Roman Catholic Papacy, we don't have the time to go into all of the details, but it ascended to power in the year 538 when the Emperor Justinian proclaimed that the Pope was Lord in the East and in the West. And exactly 1,260 years later, in 1798, General Berthier of Napoleon Bonaparte's armies entered the Vatican went into the Sistine Chapel where Pope Pius VI was celebrating Mass, the anniversary of his coronation. He was removed from the throne. His rings were taken off. His pastoral staff was taken away. The papal tiara was taken off his head, and he was told, Your power has come to an end. And he was taken as a prisoner where he died in exile in France. At that moment, the power of the papacy to control the state was gone. 
And we're going to come to some very interesting details about that a little bit later. So the time period fits the papacy perfectly. It ruled from 538 to 1798 exactly the way the prophecy specifies. I've only given you seven characteristics, but really I have 15. But because we don't have the time, I won't mention the other eight that I have. Now we must go to another prophecy that complements this prophecy. In other words, this is a prophecy that is parallel to the prophecy of Daniel 7. But before we do, let's uh, review what we've studied. What is the first kingdom? Babylon. The second kingdom is Medo-Persia. The third kingdom is Greece. The fourth kingdom is the Roman Empire. Then the Roman Empire is divided into ten kingdoms, the ten horns that come from the head of the dragon beast that represents Rome. Then you have the little horn that rises among the ten, uproots three, and rules for 1,260 years all the way to the year 1798. So you see we can follow the trajectory of history very easily. This is a disciplined approach to study Bible prophecy. This is a systematic approach. There's no guesswork involved because you can follow the trajectory of the powers. You know exactly where the starting point is and you can see all of the steps that come after that without interruption. Now let's go to Revelation chapter 13. Revelation chapter 13 and let's read verses 1 and 2. Revelation 13 and verses 1 and 2. Here John says, Then I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his heads a blasphemous name. Now you're going to see the connection with Daniel 7. It says there in verse 2, Now the beast that I saw was like a what? A leopard. His feet were like the feet of a bear. And his mouth was the, like the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him power, his throne, and great authority. Question, are these the same four beasts that are mentioned in Daniel chapter 7? Absolutely, but did you notice an interesting detail? Whereas in Daniel chapter 7 the beasts are presented, lion, bear, leopard, dragon, in Revelation chapter 13 they're presented in reverse order. Dragon, leopard, bear, lion. So you say, why in Daniel do you have uh, the order of the lion first and then the bear, the leopard and the dragon, whereas in the book of Revelation it begins with the dragon and then it goes to the leopard and it goes to the bear and it goes to the lion. The reason is very simple folks. Daniel is living in the period of the lion and Daniel is looking forwards. Whereas John, the apostle who wrote the book of Revelation, is looking backwards and these kingdoms have already passed. The lion, the bear, and the leopard have passed, and he is living in the period of the what? He's living in the period of the dragon. So Revelation 13 uh, connects very clearly with the prophecy of Daniel 7. Is that clear? But Revelation 13 is going to add some very important details to this prophecy. I want you to notice that the beast falls in the same order as where the little horn falls. Let's review Daniel 7. We have lion, bear, leopard, dragon, ten horns, little horn. In Revelation chapter 13 you have lion, bear, leopard, dragon, and if you read Revelation 12, the previous chapter, the dragon has ten horns, and then the dragon with ten horns gives his power to the beast. And so the little horn and the beast are located in the same sequence in the prophecy. Are you following me or not? So, the beast is the same as the little horn in the sequence. I'm going to repeat it again because it is extremely important. You have in Daniel 7, lion, bear, leopard, dragon, ten horns, little horn. In Revelation 13 you have lion, bear, leopard, dragon, ten horns, and beast. And so the little horn and the beast represent the very same power. But now listen up. Not only do we know that the little horn and the beast are the same power because of the sequence. But we also know because the beast performs the same actions and rules for the same time period as the little horn. Let's notice that in Revelation chapter 13 and verse 7. Revelation chapter 13 and verse 7. This is talking about the beast now, 
and notice the similarity with the little horn. It says, it was granted to him, that is the beast, to make war with the saints. Is that what the little horn did? Absolutely. And to overcome them. And authority was given him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. What about the blasphemies in the time period of the little horn? Notice Revelation chapter 13 and verse 5. It says about the beast, and he was given a mouth, speaking great things, and what? And blasphemies, the same as the little horn. And he was given authority to continue for how long? To continue for 42 months. You say, ah, that's different. 42 months is different than time times and the dividing of time. No, it isn't. What happens if you multiply 42 months times 30 days each month? What is the, what is the end product? The end product is 1260. It's expressed differently, but it's the same time period. And so we know that the beast is the same as the little horn because they're in the same place in the sequence and because the beast performs the same actions for the same time period as the little horn. But I want you to notice that Revelation 13 adds a very important detail. And that is that after the little horn ruled for 1260 years, the Bible tells us that, that it received a deadly wound. Notice Revelation chapter 13 and verse 10. Revelation 13 verse 10. Speaking about the beast that ruled 1260 years, it says, He who leads into captivity shall go into captivity. Is this what the beast did? Did the beast lead God's people into captivity? Absolutely. And then it says, He who kills with the sword, in other words, the beast that killed with the sword, must be what? Must be killed with the sword. So what is it that gave the deadly wound to the papacy, to the beast? It was the sword. Let me ask you, was the deadly wound given when its period of dominion came to an end? It would have to be because it was given later than the 1260 years, then it ruled more than 1260 years. If it was given before the 1260 years came to an end, then it didn't rule 1260 years. The deadly wound is given in 1798, when the 1260 years come to an end. And the wound was given with what? With a sword. Now what does that mean, that the wound was given with a sword? Are we dealing with symbols here? Yeah, we're dealing with symbols. Remember, the sword represents something. It's not a literal sword. It represents something. It symbolizes something. I want you to notice that there are two swords spoken of in the New Testament. The first sword is the sword that God gives to the church. It's in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 17. It says there, the Apostle Paul writing, And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. So does the church have its sword? Yes. What is the sword of the church? The sword of the church is the word of God. And how does the church use that sword? By preaching, right? In other words, when a preacher gets up and he proclaims God's word, that is the sword that penetrates. You can read it in Hebrews chapter 4, verses 12 and 13. So God has given a sword to the church. It is his word to preach his word. That's not the sword that the papacy used to kill and the sword that gave the papacy its deadly wound. You say, why not? Simply because the papacy did not use the Bible to kill anyone. So the sword that the papacy used to kill that gave it the deadly wound must represent something different than the sword that God gave to the church. Are you following me? Now let's see how the Bible defines that other sword that is given not to the church, it's given to the state to preserve the civil order. Romans chapter 13 verses 1 through 4. Romans chapter 13 verses 1 through 4. Here the Apostle Paul is going to define what the sword is. I'm beginning to read in verse 1. Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities. Who are the governing authorities? The state, right? The civil power. For there is no authority except from God and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore whoever resists the authority, in other words if you resist the authority of the state or the civil power, he resists the ordinance of God, and those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. 
For rulers, see it's talking about the civil power, for rulers are not a terror to good works but to evil. In other words, you don't have to fear the state if you obey the laws of the state. So the Apostle Paul says rulers are not a terror to good works but to evil. In other words, the people who perform bad works are the ones that need to worry. And then it says, uh, do you want to be unafraid of the authority? In other words, do you want to live without having to worry about the, the authority or the civil power? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. Now listen carefully to verse 4. For he, that is the magistrate, the ruler, the political leader, for he is God's minister to you for good. But if you do evil, be afraid, for he does not bear what? The sword in vain, for he is God's minister, an avenger, to execute wrath on him who practices evil. And then if you continue reading Romans chapter 13, you'll find that it, it clearly tells you what the state can do with the sword. It actually quotes the last six commandments. Let me ask you, does the state have the authority to punish someone who kills someone? Yes. Does it have authority to also, and uh, I know that this isn't very popular these days, to defend the sanctity of marriage? Is that a role of the state? It most certainly is. Is it a role of the state to safeguard the, the parents from abusive children? Yes, honor your father and your mother. Is it the role of the civil government to protect people's property from thieves? Yes. Is it the role of the government to protect people's reputation so that you can't simply tear down somebody's reputation? Can you take them to court and sue them for libel or for slander? You most certainly can. So if you continue reading Romans 13, it's talking about the civil power having authority to punish violations of the civil laws that govern society. Are you with me? It's not talking about the government or the state being able to use the sword to punish people who worship idols or people who worship on the wrong day or people who take the name of the Lord God in vain. Those people are going to have to face the Lord for that. But the state cannot have anything to do with people's religious observances. It only is there to preserve the civil order and it uses the sword when people disobey the civil laws. Let me ask you, can the state use the sword to throw you into jail? It sure can. Can the state uh, also confiscate your properties if you got those properties dishonestly? Oh, you better believe it. Can the state actually, in the United States at least, uh, condemn somebody to death? Absolutely. And so the use of the sword by the state means that the state uses its punitive punishment against those who violate the civil laws of the country, not religious laws. Are you understanding me? And so the church has its sword, the Word of God, and I use it when I preach it. I'm using the sword right now, by the way. And then the state has its sword, which means that it uses it to preserve the civil order of society, but it has no authority to get involved in religious matters. Are you following me? Now, the sword that the papacy used to kill was what? The state. You look at history. The papal say, we didn't kill anyone, it was the state. Yeah, but the church appealed to the power of the state to slay those who didn't agree with the state. It was the same thing as happened in the days of Christ, folks. In the days of Christ, the Jewish church wanted to kill Christ. But when they went to Pilate, they said, you know, we need your help because we can't execute the death penalty. We need the help of the civil power in order to execute this man. And he was executed not for violating the laws of Rome, he was executed because he, so, he violated, according to them, the religious laws of the church. Are you understanding me? This is a very, very important point. Now, what would happen after the papacy received its deadly wound? By the way, France took away civil power from the papacy in the French Revolution. And after that, country after country in Europe withdrew their support from the papacy and established governments where there was civil and religious liberty. The deadly wound simply means that the papacy no longer is able to use the state to accomplish its purposes. But something is going to happen, folks. Revelation 13 verse 3 tells us, tells us that there's going to be a fourth stage of this fourth beast. Revelation 13 verse 3 says that the little horn is going to recover its dominion after a period of inactivity. Notice this verse, Revelation 13 verse 3, And I saw one of his heads, that is one of the heads of the beast, 
as if it had been mortally wounded. What is it that mortally wounded the beast? The sword of the state. In other words, the state turned against the papacy. Instead of letting the papacy use it, the state turned against it. And now notice what happens as a result. When the wound is healed, it says, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world marveled and followed the beast. Wow! Is the little horn going to have another period of dominion? Is the beast going to rule again? Yeah, not only in Europe, but it's going to rule what? The world. Because it says very clearly here that the world marveled and followed the beast. If the beast is the Roman Catholic system, then the whole world at some point is going to marvel and follow this system. And you're saying, Pastor, don't tell me these things. It's too painful. I realize that it's painful, but we need to know because it's a matter of salvation. The Bible says that if you end up worshiping the beast and his image and you receive the mark of the beast, you're going to be lost. And so it's a matter of life and death. What I'm sharing with you, it's something that we need to understand and we need to accept. Now the big question is, how will the papacy recover its power? Listen, if the deadly wound means that the sword was taken away from it, what would be the healing of the deadly wound? It would be that it is going to recover what? It's going to recover the sword. It's going to recover the ability to use the state to accomplish its purposes. Are you with me or not? It's simple. Prophecy is simple. It's not complicated. And you say, but how in the world is it ever going to recover the, the sword of the state? What I'm going to share now is one of the saddest things that I have to share with you. In Revelation 13 verse 11, we find another beast, a second beast in Revelation 13. And I want to read that verse. It says, Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth. Is this beast rising in the same place as the first four beasts? No, where did the first four beasts come from? From the sea. This one comes from where? from the earth. It must rise in a different place. It continues saying, He had two horns like a what? Like a lamb. But this is a strange beast. In fact, I, I call this prophecies Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde because it says that he has two horns like a lamb, but he ends up speaking like what? He ends up speaking like a dragon. Now the question is, what does this beast represent? Let me share several characteristics and we don't have time to share all of them. Once again, contact Secrets Unsealed. You'll find our address at the end of this DVD. You want, you'll want to get these materials. They're very, very important. They have many more details than what I'm able to share here with you. It says, Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth. He had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. Now what does this beast represent? A beast is a what? It must be a nation, right? Would you agree that it must be a nation? It must be a kingdom? Absolutely, because the previous beasts were kingdoms. Now, when does this beast arise? It rises to power when the first beast falls. Because in Revelation 13 verse 10 it says, He who kills with the sword must be killed with the sword, and the very next verse says, Then. So when the first beast receives its deadly wound, then this beast rises from the earth. So around what date is this power going to arise? Around 1798 when the first beast received its deadly wound. It's going to arise in a different place than in Europe. Incidentally, do you know that the four beasts of Daniel chapter 7, the first two were Asian powers. Babylon and Medo-Persia are in Asia. The next two powers are European powers, Greece and Rome. And by the way, each kingdom moves further west, which would seem to indicate then that the next kingdom would be further west of Rome. Let me ask you, what is west of Rome? Don't tell me the Atlantic Ocean. <laughs> That's true, the Atlantic Ocean, but there's no kingdom in the Atlantic Ocean. Really, when you cross the Atlantic Ocean, you find what? The United States of America. Is the United States of America a long ways from where those other kingdoms rose? Waters represent multitudes, nations, tongues, and peoples. 
Were there lots of multitudes, nations, tongues, and peoples here in North America when the settlers came from Europe over here? No, it was very sparsely populated. There were, there were no waters, in other words. By the way, this nation has to be a global political superpower. And you say, why does it need to be a political su superpower? Because the Bible tells us that it will command the whole world to worship the first beast. It must have global political power to lead the whole world to worship the first beast. It must be a global economic superpower, because the prophecy tells us that people will be forbidden from buying and selling on a global scale, unless you worship the image and you receive the mark. It must also be a global military power, because we're told that anyone who does not agree with this power, this beast has the power to kill them. Are you understanding me? Very interesting characteristics. Incidentally, another characteristic is that this beast that rises from the earth is a contemporary of the first beast, but is younger than the first beast. Are you following me? Now I want you to notice something very interesting. Each of the previous beasts destroyed the beast before it to rise to power. Would you agree with that? Did the bear polish off the lion to rise to power? Yes. Did the leopard finish off the bear? Yes. Did the dragon finish off the leopard? Yes. But this beast is very strange. Listen carefully. Because prophecy tells us that this beast is not going to fight against the previous power, it is going to help the previous power recover its dominion. It's contemporary with the first beast. It arises at the end of the period of dominion of the first beast, and it is going to help the first beast recover the dominion that it lost. Let me share several details that prove this point. Revelation chapter 13 and verse 12 says this, speaking about this beast from the earth, and he exercises all the authority of the first beast. So by whose authority does this beast from the earth rule? the authority of the first beast. It says, and he exercises all the authority of the first beast in its presence. I like the way the NIV reads. The NIV says that it exercises all the authority of the first beast on its behalf. In its presence means in behalf of the first beast. And now notice it continues saying, and causes the earth and those who dwell in it to do what? To worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. So by whose authority does this second beast rule? the authority of the first beast. What does it command people to do? It commands everyone to worship what? The first beast. Incidentally, this power also make a, makes an image of the first beast. Notice Revelation chapter 13 and verse 14. Speaking about this beast, it says, And he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword, and lived. So this power, listen carefully, this power rules by the authority of the first beast, it commands everyone to worship the first beast, we're told that it makes an image of the first beast, and we're told in verse 16 that it imposes the mark of the first beast. It says in Revelation 13 verse 16, He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads. Are you catching the picture? Is this second beast really an enemy of the first beast? No. This is a strange beast different than all of the previous ones, because the previous beasts fought against the power that came immediately before to ascend to the throne, but we're told here that we have these two contemporary beasts, one that ruled 1260 years. When the 1260 years come to an end, this other beast rises to power, and it ends up eventually helping the first beast recover its power, not destroying the first beast, but helping the first beast to recover its power. Are you starting to catch an interesting picture? Now we need to talk about the two horns that it had. The Bible tells us that it had two horns like the horns of a what? The horns of a lamb. The word lamb is used 29 times in the book of Revelation. Every single time the word lamb is used, it refers to Jesus Christ. So in some way, these two horns are related to Jesus Christ. Now we need to understand what the horns represent, and then we'll see how they're related to Jesus Christ. 
In order to understand what these two horns represent, we need to go to a very close prophecy in the Old Testament, a prophecy that's very similar to this one. Daniel chapter 8 and verse 3. Daniel chapter 8 and verse 3. Here Daniel says, Then I lifted my eyes and saw, and there, standing beside the river, was a ram. Do you know what a ram is? A ram is a male sheep. And so it says that he saw a ram which had how many horns? Had two horns. And the two horns were high, but one was higher than the other. Remember the bear that it was higher on one side than the, on the other? So this is the Medes and Persians. It says one was higher than the other and the higher one came out last. That per fits history perfectly. Because the Medes rose to, rose to power first, but then they disappeared and the Persians became the predominant power, just like the prophecy says. Now what is represented by this ram that has two horns? You notice it's only one beast, right? It's only one beast, it's a ram. But the ram has two horns. Now the question is, what do the two horns on this one beast, the ram, represent? We don't have to guess, because Daniel chapter 8 and verse 20 tells us what this ram represents. Daniel explains in chapter 8 and verse 20, the ram that you saw having the two horns, they are the kings of what? They are the kings of Media and Persia. So what do the two horns represent? They represent two kingdoms, the Medes and the what? And the Persians. In other words, there was going to be one nation that was composed of how many kingdoms? One nation with two kingdoms. Now you say, what, how is this related to the beast that comes from the earth in Revelation chapter 13? Is it just one beast in Revelation 13? Yes, one beast rises from the earth. Uh, does that beast have two horns? Yes. So must these two horns represent two kingdoms? Yes. It must mean that this nation is one nation but it is a nation that recognizes how many kingdoms? Two kingdoms. And they are the same kingdoms that Jesus recognized because they are two horns like the horns of a what? Of a lamb. So we need to ask, which two kingdoms did Jesus recognize? We don't have to guess. In Matthew chapter 22 verses 19 to 21, there was this conflict that arose over, over the tax money, whether you needed to pay taxes or not to Caesar. And I'm only going to read beginning in verse 19. Jesus tells those who are there, because they say, should we pay taxes to Caesar or not? And so Jesus says, show me the tax money. So they brought him a denarius. And he said to them, whose image and inscription is this? In other words, whose face is on this coin, and what is the name on the coin? They said to him, Caesar's. And he said to them, Render therefore to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and the things to God that are God's. How many kingdoms did Jesus recognize? Did Jesus the Lamb recognize? He recognized two kingdoms. The first would be the kingdom of Caesar, which we call the what? The civil power or the state. And the other kingdom is the kingdom of Jesus, which is his what? His church. So in other words, Jesus recognizes two kingdoms. By the way, Jesus clearly taught that these two kingdoms must remain separate. Do you remember on the Mount of Temptation that the devil offered Jesus all the kingdoms of the world? Let's read about it. Matthew chapter 4 verses 8 through 10. Again the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world. So the devil shows Jesus all the kingdoms of this world. They're the political kingdoms, right? The civil powers of the world. And he shows the, Jesus their glory. And he said to him, the devil says to Jesus, all these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. You can have all the kingdoms of the world if you fall down and worship me. Jesus says, oh yeah, okay, give them to me. That's not what Jesus said. Then Jesus said to him, away with you, Satan! For it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God, and Him only you shall serve. Did Jesus accept the rulership over the kingdoms of the world? He did not. Notice John 18 and verse 36. Here Jesus has a pri private interview with Pontius Pilate. 
And Pilate asks Jesus whether he's a king. And notice what Jesus answered to Pilate. My kingdom is not of this world. How many kingdoms did Jesus recognize? Two. His kingdom and what? The kingdoms of the what? Of the world. We just noticed it. So he says, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, what would happen? Oh, he says, my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. Are you understanding this? Now listen carefully. Did Jesus recognize that God had placed Pontius Pilate to rule as a civil ruler? Yeah. You remember that Pilate said, you, don't you know that I have power to release you? What did Jesus say? You would have no power over me if it was not given to you from above. So in other words, was Pilate the civil ruler by the will of God? Yes. Did Jesus accept that kingdom that Pilate ruled over? No, he didn't. Because Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I would not be delivered to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from here. Jesus always referred to his kingdom as the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God. He never appealed to the Roman state to aid him in his mission. He rebuked James and John because, he, because they wanted to incinerate those Samaritan villages. When he fed the 5,000, the multitude wanted to crown him king, and he left. And when Peter used his sword to defend Jesus in the garden, Jesus said, put away that sword, because he who kills with the sword will be killed with the sword. Very similar to Revelation chapter 13 and verse 10. Jesus did not come to take over the civil powers of the world. But you know, the papacy in the third and fourth centuries and I say, this, I say this respectfully, the devil offered the kingdoms of the world to the papacy, and the papacy accepted the rulership over those kingdoms. So what did Jesus come to establish? Luke 17, 20 and 21 tells us what kingdom Jesus came to establish. Let me ask you, do, do the laws of the state really change people? No. Look at the mess that our country is in. You can make millions of laws and people won't obey them because their heart is wicked above all things. So where does the change need to take place? It needs to take place in the heart. Jesus knew that. So he says, it does no good for me to take over the political kingdoms of the world and give laws against climate change and give laws to protect the family and give laws for this and that because people by their sinful heart are going to do those things anyway. I came to implant the principles of my kingdom in the heart, and then society will change. Not by taking over the political system, but by changing the human heart. Luke 17, 20 and 21. Now when he was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, of course they believed that it was a civil kingdom, he answered them and said, the kingdom of God does not come with observation. In other words, the kingdom of God doesn't come with an external show of power. Nor will they say, see here, or see there, for indeed the kingdom of God is within you. Let me ask you, would it be proper for the church to receive money from the state for the church to function? No. Would it be proper for the state to tell the church, hey, give, give us a portion of your tithes? No. Because we have a financial duty to Caesar and we have a financial duty to God, but they are separate not together. They are two horns, the two kingdoms that Jesus recognized, to the civil power, one responsibility, and to the religious power, the church, another responsibility. So, this nation, which by the way represents the United States, there's only one nation in the world that fits all of these characteristics. It arose in a different place. It's a superpower economically, politically, militarily, it rose when the previous power fell, and it was built upon the idea that in this one nation there are two kingdoms separate from one another. You say, oh really? Absolutely. Let's talk a little bit about the founding fathers of the United States. Even though the founding fathers were not churchgoers, they were well acquainted with the Bible. 
They also admired Christ and knew all about what had happened to Jesus when the church of the, that day had appealed to the Roman state to crucify Christ. They knew all about the history of the church in the Middle Ages. In fact, our founding fathers, Jefferson, Jefferson, Madison, Franklin, and others, they frequently mentioned the Inquisition. They knew about the, period, the colonial period in North America, in the United States, where only those who belonged to the established church could occupy political office. It was required to attend church on Sunday, and if you didn't, you were fined, you were imprisoned, and in at least three states there was a death sentence against those who did not go to church on Sunday. And the tithes were paid to the state, and the state would pay all of the ministers. In other words, there was a mixture of church and state, and there was persecution. Just study the story of Roger Williams. He was persecuted for his views of the separation of church and state, and he had to flee in the dead of winter. It's a fascinating story. Now listen carefully. The founding documents of the United States were the Declaration of Independence in 1776 that affirms that all men are created equal and they have certain inalienable rights among which are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. In 1787 the Constitution of the United States was ratified. And finally in 1791 the Bill of Rights, which are the first ten amendments to the Constitution, were approved. It's interesting that all of these documents were approved slightly before the previous beast received its deadly wound in 1798. One power was about to fall and the other power was rising at that time. An examination of the writings of the Constitutional Fathers of the United States reveals clearly that they believe that there are two kingdoms in the United States of America and those two kingdoms are to remain forever separate. According to their view, the church has a spiritual sword, which is the Word of God, and the state has a material sword to punish violations of civil law. But they clearly said that the state cannot enforce religious observances. In fact, this nation was founded on two great principles. One is called republicanism. It's, it has nothing to do with the Republican Party. It is a republic a system of government that is a republic, that is a representative civil government with its civil sword. And the other one was Protestantism, which represents a religious government with a religious sword, that is with the Bible. The founding fathers of the United States established a revolutionary system of governance. You know in Europe the king was the absolute ruler, and what the king said that was law. In matters of religion, what the Pope said was law. And if the Pope said jump, you didn't say, I don't want to, you would say, how high do you want me to jump? Because all of the religious power flowed from up down, and all of the civil power flowed from the king down. But the Founding Fathers established a revolutionary system of government where the people themselves governed themselves. In other words, it was from the bottom up a government of the people, by the people, and for the people. And the Founding Fathers recognized that there are two kingdoms that exist in this nation that are separate one from another, that the state should not infringe upon the church and the church should not infringe upon the state. Totally and radically different than what the papacy practiced during the 1260 years. The papacy allied themselves with the powers of Europe and they persecuted anyone who did not agree with the church. They tried to eradicate the heretics in order to keep the church pure. Let me read you some of the statements by uh, the Founding Fathers of the United States. First of all, George Washington, the first president of the United States, had this to say. If I could, you know, he sat and presided over the Constitutional Convention where the Constitution was ratified. He says, if I could have entertained the slightest apprehension that the Constitution framed by the Convention where I had the honor to preside might possibly endanger the religious rights of any ecclesiastical society, certainly I would never have placed my signature on it. And if I could now conceive that the general government, that means the federal government, might ever be so administered as to render the liberty of conscience insecure, I beg you will be persuaded that no one would be more zealous than myself 
to establish effectual barriers against the horrors of spiritual tyranny and every species of religious persecution. For you, doubtless remember, I have often expressed my sentiments that any man conducting himself as a good citizen and being accountable to God alone for his religious opinions ought to be protected in worshiping the deity according to the dictates of his own conscience. Very clear, George Washington. Benjamin Franklin had a sense of humor. Notice what Benjamin Franklin said. When a religion is good, I conceive that it will support itself. And when it does not support itself, and God does not take care to support it, so that its professors are obliged to call for the help of the civil powers, tis a sign, I apprehend, of it being a bad one. <laughs> Interesting. Notice Thomas Jefferson, one of the architects of the Constitution, and these words that I'm going to read are etched on the Jefferson Monument, monument in Washington, D.C. I love to go there to the Jefferson Monument. And I just love to, to look at the inscriptions on the monument. It's, it's spectacular, the principles upon which this nation was established. Total separation of church and state. Totally and radically different than the principles of the Roman Catholic Papacy. Thomas Jefferson had to say this, and this is etched there at the Jefferson Memorial. It says, Almighty God has created the mind free. All attempts to influence it by temporal punishment or burdens are a departure from the plan of the holy author of our religion. No man shall be compelled to frequent or support any religious worship or ministry or shall otherwise suffer on account of his religious opinions or belief. But all men shall be free to profess and by argument to maintain their opinions in matters of religion. I know but one code of morality for men whether acting singly or collectively. I'm going to read several other statements from Jefferson. He said, The legitimate powers of government extend to such acts only as are injurious to others. See, those are the last commandments of God's law. And then he said this, It does me no injury for my neighbor to say that there are twenty gods or no gods. It neither picks my pocket nor breaks my leg. Pretty interesting way of expressing it. Here's another one. He said in 1782, It is error alone which needs the support of government. Truth can stand by itself. Jefferson knew the dangers of clergy taking over the political system. He said this in the year 1800. By the way, you can get all of these statements if you contact Secrets on Seal, plus many more. The clergy, by getting themselves established by law, and engrafted into the machine of government have been a very formidable engine against the civil and religious rights of man. Here's another one, 1813. History, I believe, furnishes no example of a priest-ridden people maintaining a free civil government. And finally, in 1814, he stated, in every country and in every age, the priest has been hostile to liberty. He is always in alliance with the despot, abetting his abuses in return for protection to his own. How could this be clearer? Two kingdoms in one nation, separation of church and state. When you keep the church and the state separate, folks, both function well. When you join church and state, the result inevitably is persecution. An extreme example of this is, for example, the, the, the Muslims over there, ISIS. You know, the state, the polit political power, and the religious principles are together. And they'll cut the head off of anyone who does not agree with their religion. The same happened during the Dark Ages, during the Middle Ages, sad to say. Let me tell you something about the Danbury Baptist Association in 1802. They were uh, concerned that they might lose their religious liberty. And so they wrote a letter to um, Thomas Jefferson saying, you know, what guarantee do we have that our religious uh, principles and our conscience is going to be respected? Here is what was, uh, what was the answer of Thomas Jefferson. He said to them, 
believing with you, that is with the Danbury Baptists, that religion is a matter which lies solely between man and his God, that he owes account to none other for his faith or his worship, that the legitimate powers of government reach actions only and not opinions, I contemplate with sovereign reverence that act of the whole American people which declared that their legislature should make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. And then he says, thus building a wall of separation between church and state. It's called the wall metaphor. Jefferson clearly believed in a wall of separation between church and state totally different than what the Roman Catholic papacy believes. So the Roman Catholic papacy believes that, church and, that the state should support the church, the doctrines and practices of the church. And if the United States ever allows itself to be used by the papacy, the result will be persecution. It will be the healing of the deadly wound. Let me read you a couple of statements by James Madison, another one of the founding fathers. He's called the father of the Constitution, incidentally. Just a couple of statements. He says, There is not a shadow of right in the general government to intermeddle with religion. Its least interference with religion would be a most flagrant usurpation. I can appeal to my uniform conduct on this subject that I have warmly supported religious freedom. And here's another one. We are teaching the world the great truth that governments do better without kings and nobles than with them. That's called republicanism, by the way, letting the people govern themselves. He continues, The merit will be doubled by the other lesson that religion flourishes in a greater purity without than with the aid of the government. That's Protestantism. You know, sometimes I'm lecturing and I say to people, I ask them the question, To how many kingdoms do you belong? So let's suppose that you're citizens of the United States. You're in one nation, right? How many kingdoms do you belong to? Two. Are you church members? Yeah, so you belong to a religious kingdom, right? Do you have a passport? The passport is the blood of the Lamb, right? Let me ask you, if you're a U.S. citizen, uh, are you a member of that kingdom? Yes. Uh, do you have a passport? Of course you have a passport. So you're in one nation, but you belong in that one nation to two what? To two kingdoms. The first kingdom, you become a citizen by birth. The second king, kingdom, you become a citizen by the new birth. Notice what John Adams had to say, well, also one of the founding fathers. Have you ever heard of the Treaty of Tripoli? You have Christians today saying, this is a Christian nation. Let me tell you folks, this is not a Christian nation. This was supposed to be a, a nation of Christians. Because a Christian nation would be a violation of the separation of church and state. Because it would be establishing a religion. And so in the Treaty of Tripoli, signed on June 10, 1797, and submitted to the Congress, uh, this Treaty of Tripoli said the following, The government of the United States is not in any sense founded upon the Christian religion. And by the way, you know what's interesting? This uh, treaty was sent to the Senate of the United States in May of 1797. And it was read aloud to all of the senators. They were all given printed copies of it and it was voted unanimously by all of the senators. It was also printed in several papers in Philadelphia, and there was never any complaint from the people saying, hey, what do you mean that this nation was not founded, that this is not a Christian nation? There was no complaints, because they understood that to say that this is a Christian nation is to violate the separation of church and state, because you're establishing a what? A religion. Allow me to say something about the First Amendment to the Constitution of the United States. The First Amendment to the Constitution contains the two horns like a lamb, civil and religious liberty, a recognition that there is a state and there is a church in the one nation. 
Some people say, well, there's no place in the Constitution that says separation of church and state. Not in so many words. But when you read the First Amendment, it becomes very clear that it is protecting civil and religious liberty, and that religion and the civil power are to remain separate. Let me read you the First Amendment. By the way, it's part of the Constitution. You're, you're aware that the amendments are part of the Constitution, right? This is the First Amendment. Congress shall make no law. Now what part of no law don't you understand? <laughs> Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion. It's called the first clause of the First Amendment. Congress cannot ex establish any religious observance. So if Congress, for example, if Congress should say that everybody has to keep Sunday, would that be a constitutional law? That would be unconstitutional because that would be establishing what? A day of worship. That would be establishing religion. So it says that the state, the Congress, which drafts the laws, cannot establish religion, any religious observance. It says Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion. Notice it doesn't say a religion or a church. It says religion. And then the second clause says, or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. In other words, you have a right to practice your religion without the interference of the state, and the state cannot establish a religious observance. They're called the Establishment Clause and the Free Exercise Clause. Let me ask you, does that separate church and state? Clearly it separates church and state. And incidentally, you know what the third clause says? It guarantees civil liberty. So the First Amendment guarantees religious liberty by forbidding Congress to make any law that establishes religion or that forbids the free exercise of religion. That protects the religious side and the civil side, the First Amendment continues saying, or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. Folks, the Bible tells us that at the end, the great controversy is going to be over who you worship. God is the Creator, and God has a sign that He is the Creator. Let's read Revelation chapter 14, verses 6 and 7. Then I saw another angel, this is God's last message to the world, then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. This is a worldwide message. Saying with a loud voice, Fear God, and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment has come. And now listen, and worship Him who made heaven and earth, the sea, and the springs of water. Do you know where that language comes from? From the fourth commandment of God's law. What is the fourth commandment of God's law? Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, because in six days God created the world, and everything that is in them, and he rested on the seventh day. Therefore you are to work six, and you are to rest on the seventh. So this first angel calls to worship God, and brings to view the language of the Sabbath commandment, which we already identified in our first presentation, that the Sabbath is a sign, or a seal, between God and his people. So let me ask you, if the Sabbath is the sign that we recognize God as Creator. Does the beast also have a sign? Yes. Are people going to worship the beast? They're going to worship the beast, which we've already identified as the papacy. So let me ask you this. Does the beast also have a sign? Yes. It's a different day. It's a rival day. And you know, the Pope says that, you know, Sunday needs to be a day for family. It needs to be a day for the environment to rest. It needs to be a day when people are released from work so that they're not workaholics in this capitalist system. And I say, wonderful, wonderful. You know, we need to give rest to people who work hard. We need families to gather together. We certainly need to deal with climate change, but he's got the day wrong. Because the Bible says that it's the Sabbath when this is supposed to happen. And it's supposed to be the entire Sabbath, not only part of the Sabbath. So let's review what we studied. Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome. Rome is divided into ten kingdoms. Then you have the little horn, 1,260 years. 
receives a deadly wound, there is a period where persecution cease, ceases, and then the deadly wound of the beast is what? Is healed. And persecution comes again. The whole world marvels after the beast. Let me ask you, can we know exactly where we are in the course of history today? We are now, folks, at the very point of the healing of the deadly wound, the final healing of the deadly wound. You say, how's that? In closing, I'd like to say that there's a very troubling scenario. You say, how is it a troubling scenario? As you know, the Pope is coming to Philadelphia. Millions of people from every religious persuasion on the planet and from every country on the globe are going to be present there in Philadelphia. It's calculated that they might, there might be as many as two million people from all of the world there longing to see the Pope. They've closed off 20 miles of the inner city where people will not be able to get in on Friday, September 25, or on Saturday, September 26, or even on Sunday. It's scary that the relationship between the papacy and the United States is getting closer and closer. Starting with the holy alliance between the United States and the Vatican in the times of Ronald Reagan, when the papacy allied with the United States led to the fall of the Soviet Union. You have President Obama asking the Pope to help him reestablish diplomatic relations with Cuba. You have the Pope coming and addressing a joint session of Congress. I mean, radically different philosophy, totally different philosophy than what the United States was built on. You have the Pope who's going to go to the White House to talk with the President about policy matters. Should this concern you in the light of what we've studied concerning Bible prophecy? You know what's sad? Is that Christians today are looking for the fulfillment of prophecy to the Middle East. They look and they say, ISIS, that's the enemy. Iran, that's the enemy. You know, and, and Russia is going to come and going to attack Israel and it's China, and everybody's looking east. And meanwhile, by the sequence of powers that we've studied, the papacy grows in power. The United States helps the papacy and is relating to the papacy, and nobody can see that this is fulfilling prophecy because they are looking in the wrong place. Is that the way the devil works? Does he try to hide things so that people don't understand and can't see clearly the fulfillment of Bible prophecy? Absolutely. Let me read you, in closing, a text that we find in Scripture. John 17 and verse 14. Here Jesus is speaking and He's talking about His disciples. He's actually praying to His Father about His disciples. He says this, I have given them your word, and the world has hated them. Were the disciples loved? Do you know that every single one of them was killed except for John, who was exiled on the Isle of Patmos? All of them died violent deaths, martyrs' deaths. And so it says here, Jesus says, I have given them your word. I've given my disciples your word. And the world has hated them because they are not of the world just as I am not of the world. Should we fear a system that instead of being hated by the world is loved by the world? Let me read you a statement that was, read, that was presented over the radio in 1955 by Bishop Fulton Sheen. You know, he's a pioneer in bringing the Roman Catholic Church to television and to the radio. A real pioneer. Back in 1959, I mean 1955, the United States wanted nothing to do with the papacy. You remember that, that John F. Kennedy had to go and speak to a group of ministers to guarantee them that he wasn't going to get his orders from the Pope. And so in 1955, notice what Sheen said. I wonder what he would say today. This is what he said. If I were not a Catholic and were looking for 
the true church in the world today, I would look for the one church which did not get along well with the world. In other words, I would look for the church which the world hated. Interesting. My reason for doing this would be that if Christ is in any one of the churches of the world today, He must be hated, as He was when He was on earth in the flesh. Listen carefully now. If you would find Christ today, then find the church that does not get along with the world. Look for the church that is hated by the world as Christ was hated by the world. Now contrast that with Revelation chapter 13 and verse 3. Until the Pope comes to Philadelphia, the whole world is glued onto the television. The whole world is coming to where he's at. Did Bible prophecy tell us about that? Most certainly. Revelation chapter 13 and verse 3 says, And I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded. That's 1798. And his deadly wound was healed. And who heals the wound according to what we've studied? The United States. The helping power that makes an image imposes the mark commands everyone to worship, exercises the authority, does everything in behalf of the first beast. We're seeing that being fulfilled now as I speak. The last part of verse 3 says, And all the world marveled and followed the beast. Have you learned anything from what we studied? The sequence is clear. Don't be offended. Don't get mad at me. You need to get mad at Scripture if you're going to get mad at anyone. You need to get mad at Jesus, at the founding fathers of the United States. Because both the Bible and history clearly show that what we have studied was fulfilled to the very letter. The big question is, will we listen? Will we set aside our prejudices? Has this caused so much pain that we'll just shove it aside and say, you know, it sounds reasonable, it sounds true, but I was born in this church and I'm going to stay in this church the rest of my life. Or will we listen to what God says in Bible prophecy and take the step of keeping God's holy law, keeping the sign that He is the Creator, and that sign, of course, is not Sunday, the first day of the week. That sign is God's holy seventh day Sabbath. The question has been made. You have the answer in your hands. Amen. 